Another leading Chevron Doctrine case involves these two birds, the northern spotted owl and the red cockaded woodpecker. The agency action that was challenged is a rule promulgated by the Secretary of the Interior. The rule elaborates the meaning of a statutory term. Harm in the definition of take in the statute may include significant habitat modification or degradation where it actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavioral patterns, including breeding, feeding, or sheltering. Take. This is among the first English words we learn, but it was given a technical sense in the statute. The term take in the Endangered Species Act means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or to attempt to engage in any such conduct. The issue in the case is whether to uphold the agency reading. Chevron was applied, and the court upheld the agency. Justice Scalia wrote a spirited dissent. Like all of his dissents, they're spirited. He had had extensive personal acquaintance with the taking of wildlife. Conceding that the agency reading would have to be upheld at Chevron Step 2, Justice Scalia insisted that there was no ambiguity and that Congress had spoken directly to the precise issue in question and spoken directly contrary to the agency's reading. All the statutory terms, but one, refer to direct and intentional acts, according to Justice Scalia. But what about harm? Justice Scalia applied a canon of statutory construction to harm. Noscitur a sociis, which means birds of a feather flock together. Because all the other terms refer to direct intentional acts, the term harm has to also. The majority was not impressed. Justice Scalia's reading would make nonsense of an, of an amendment Congress made to authorize the Secretary to grant a permit to take if such taking is incidental to and not the purpose of the carrying out of an otherwise lawful activity. If no unintentional harm is taking, what reason was there to give the Secretary the power to issue permits for unintentional taking? The legislative history also indicated that Congress understood the term take more broadly. The plaintiffs in Sweet Home were lumber companies, but the House report acknowledged that the Secretary could even prohibit bird watching if that would disturb the birds and make it difficult for them to hatch or raise their young. If that is what Congress meant by take, then of course cutting down the trees in which birds breed would be meant as well. Which brings us to this question. Could the agency have interpreted the statute not to reach habitat degradation? In other words, is the court deciding in favor of the agency at Chevron Step 1 or at Step 2? If at Step 1, the secretary could not have interpreted the term take differently and cannot change the agency's interpretation. Congress spoke directly to the issue. For the court, Justice Stevens wrote, our conclusions that Congress did not unambiguously manifest its intent to adopt the respondent's view and that the Secretary's interpretation is reasonable suffice to decide this case. We need not decide whether the statutory definition of take compels the, the Secretary's interpretation. That may sound a bit weaselly. If the court won't say whether the statute compelled the agency reading, how is anyone to know whether the next Secretary of the Interior is free to change interpretations in the way the EPA was free to do in Chevron? Stay tuned. In 1995, at the direction of President Clinton, the FDA promulgated a set of rules intended to discourage the consumption of tobacco by minors. By a 5-4 to four decision, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down these regulations. The court framed the issue in Chevron terms at the outset. Because this case involves an administrative agency's construction of a statute that it administers, 
our analysis is governed by Chevron. Ever since Chevron was decided in 1983, it has been understood as the court's definitive statement of its task in applying APA Section 706A2. The reviewing court shall decide all relevant questions of law and interpret statutory provisions. By the way, the molecule depicted is nicotine. At the time the FDA acted, and today, the consensus estimate was that tobacco-related illnesses contributed to over 400,000 deaths in the U.S. every year. That is a lot of death. It's an order of magnitude, that is to say 10 times greater than the average annual motor vehicle fatality rate or the average annual firearm mortality rate. It was a finding of the FDA that the giant tobacco companies had deliberately targeted the young for advertising. Cartoon characters represented smoking as cool fun. Notice that Joe Camel is wearing a motorcycle helmet, presumably to be safe. The FDA also found that the tobacco giants deliberately targeted the immature with flavored cigarettes. These were among the reasons the FDA reconsidered its long-standing policy to leave tobacco alone. The FDA regulations are not described in detail in our casebook excerpt. It is worth considering what those regulations stated. They were of three kinds. The first, the access regulations, were intended to limit the availability of tobacco products to minors. The second set of FDA regulations limited the marketing of tobacco products to minors. Only the third set of regulations promulgated by the FDA required any change on the packaging of tobacco products. A label like that shown above was required on all cigarette and other tobacco packaging. The FDA acted pursuant to its long-standing authority to regulate drugs. A drug is defined under the statute as anything that is intended to affect the structure or any function of the body. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act further defines a device as an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, or other similar or related article, including any component, part, or accessory which is intended to affect the structure or any function of the body. Congress created the FDA in 1906 to assure that drugs were safe and effective to be taken and used by the public, which was generally in a poor position to evaluate the implicit and explicit claims made by the manufacturers. Sometimes the FDA was late in removing dangerous remedies from the market. For example, a pepper upper called Radithor was manufactured and sold to consumers in the U.S. from 1918 to 1928. It was widely advertised. Eben Byers, U.S. amateur golf champion, appeared in print ads that touted the energetic glow he felt when using Radithor. Byers' death in 1932 was reported in the Wall Street Journal under the headline, The Radium Water Worked Fine Until His Jaw Came Off. The dangers of tobacco were known as early as the 1950s. But as of 1906, tobacco and its components were assumed to be as safe as any of a wide range of naturally occurring substances like radium. The tobacco industry invested heavily in commercial advertising. Health claims were common. Cigarettes were marketed as a remedy for such afflictions as obesity. Manufacturers competed by claiming to minimize side effects. At the same time, their own research revealed to the tobacco companies the devastating health consequences of the, their, of the use of their products. They kept this to themselves and commissioned research to try to obscure the truth. Celebrity endorsements were also a common theme in advertising. In the face of mounting evidence of the health hazard posed by tobacco, the FTC proposed in 1964 to require warning labels on cigarette packaging. But the FTC was preempted by the Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Bill of 1965, 
which required a specifically worded warning label. In 1971, Congress acted to forbid television advertising of cigarettes, but print advertising continued much as before. This camel ad emphasizes the euphoric effect of smoking. What is the nature of this reward? Is it simply an appreciation of how good smoke can taste? Nicotine is the reward agent in tobacco. Tobacco smoke clearly affects the structure and function of the body and is marketed with the intention that it do so. Responding to increasing criticism from many quarters, the tobacco giants altered their advertising to emphasize the purely psychological effects of smoking, as though they had no neurochemical basis. Query. Was it Congress's intention in 1906 to ban products containing radium? No. In challenging an FDA regulation in 1932, would Radithor have been heard to say that the FDA had no jurisdiction because Congress had not intended to remove radium products from the market? Surely not. Statutes are typically understood to mean whatever it is that they meant from the moment of their enactment. Congress can change a statute by amendment, but that is a process that requires, as we saw in Chata, bicameral passage and presentment. But even an amendment cannot change what a statute meant when it was enacted. But Justice O'Connor, writing for the court in Brown and Williamson, suggests the contrary. She wrote, at the time a statute is enacted, it may have a range of plausible meanings. Over time, however, subsequent acts can shape or focus those meanings. Congress is not limited to repealing, amending, or regretting statutes, she writes. Congress can also shape or focus the meaning of existing statutes without amending them or even referring to them. She explains this as akin to attending to the context in which the 1906 Act was passed. Tobacco does indeed present a unique context, but Justice O'Connor does not explain how later enactment, enactments can change the context of earlier enactments. The court's reasoning is summarized in a simple syllogism. Premise one, if the FDA had jurisdiction over tobacco, it would have to ban it. Premise two, Congress, however, has foreclosed the removal of the tobacco products from the market. Conclusion, the FDA has no jurisdiction over tobacco. The dissenters take issue with both premises. As to premise two, how has Congress foreclosed the FDA from regulating, even banning, the sale of tobacco products? The court cites a 1938 statute that a junior associate would be embarrassed to mention. The court also cites the Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Bill of 1965, but its preamble does not appear to repeal the FDA Act by implication, and in any case, as the court has repeatedly held, repeals by implication are disfavored. The operative language of the 1965 Act has only to do with labeling. There is clearly an inconsistency between the FDA labeling regulations, which we looked at, and the 1965 Act, but that does not touch the FDA's access and promotion regulations. How does the invalidity of the FDA labeling regulation support the far more drastic conclusion that nicotine is not a drug within the meaning of the 1906 Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act? The court writes, the regulation of product labeling is an integral aspect of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Ergo, Congress has over the past 35 years precluded an interpretation of the 
Food, Drug, and Gum Cosmetic Act that grants FDA jurisdiction to regulate tobacco products. The past 35 years, however, does not reach back to 1906, or even to 1938 when the amended Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed. What, query, what result if Congress did not speak directly to the issue of nicotine in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act? The answer, of course, is that Chevron Step 2, the issue would be whether the FDA reading is within the range of plausible meanings, as Justice O'Connor had already acknowledged. If Congress did not speak directly at Chevron Step 1, then the issue for the court is the Step 2 question of whether the FDA reading is reasonable as surely it is. What is the lesson of Brown and Williamson? Shown above is the introductory frame from a presentation in 2015 at a meeting of the Rocky Mountain Coal Mining Institute, an industry group representing coal interests in western states. Survival is victory is the lesson for the coal industry, but survival for some can mean death for others. For us, one lesson is that when the court does not like what will emerge at Chevron Step 2, it will work harder to find that Congress spoke directly to the precise issue at Step 1. Ultimately, Congress acted to correct the result in Brown and Williamson. But in the intervening years, perhaps millions of Americans were exposed to an addictive carcinogen. Another lesson. What Alexander Hamilton called the least dangerous branch can still be dangerous. If you smoke or know someone who does, consider these facts, which the tobacco giants knew as long as go as the 1950s, but for half a century, causing tens of millions of deaths, lied about to the American public. <laughs>